Moonlight Restoration Forum presentation for the 2021 AWA Historical Conference. This is a compilation of hints and kinks that you may consider using as you progress through your own conservation and restoration activities. Some techniques you will likely never employ, but hopefully it will expand your horizons as to what may be possible. Thanks to Dan Bedford in Brisbane, Australia, for his contribution to this forum. His topic is conserving technical books. We all know that much of what has been published has now been scanned by one entity or the other. Some of the information is readily available, but a very large percentage of the scanned documents are restricted by various forms of paywalls. For professional researchers, this may be little more than a cost of doing business, but for the amateur researcher, these fees or subscriptions are a substantial burden. So there is definitely some value in preserving privately held books. There are several books recently in print that are relevant to preserving private copies, and Dan has taken the time to show us his methods. Dan tells us that the theme for the 2019 Annual Convention of the Historical Wireless Society of Southeast Queensland was to be a restoration. Rather than do a ubiquitous radio restoration, Dan decided to restore a spare copy of a radio text. His presentation title page. Restoring an Old Wireless Textbook, The Admiralty Handbook of Wireless Telegraphy, 1931, by Dan Bedford, member of the Antique Wireless Association, Historical Radio Society of Australia, and the Historical Wireless Society of Southeast Queensland. This is the sorry state of Dan's entry as found. The spine was detached and the boards were quite loose. This book is not considered valuable, so a full-blown restoration was not in order. He just wanted to restore it to a usable condition. The first step was to disassemble the text block from the damaged casing. The remaining scrim was cut through to free the boards from the text block. Removing the boards. There was little to do here as there was only the crumbling remains of the scrim to cut through. The next step was to clean up the spine face of the text block by removing the old residue of dried glue, scrim, and tapes. Traditional glues are almost always water soluble. These are the tools used to remove the old glue. Dampen and soften the old water based adhesive and carefully scrape it away. Of course, you want to use the absolute minimum water on your brush or cloth. Note that the old tapes were sewn in, so will be left in place to avoid damaging the threads. New tapes are simply glued in place rather than sewn. Here we see various features of the text block. The spine is rounded to enable fine opening of the book the shoulder of the text block. The boards will fit snugly under the shoulders. The sections. The text block is made up of a number of individually assembled sections of text. The tapes. The tapes assist in securing the text block to the case. As the boards were in fair condition, and it would have been difficult to safely remove the paste downs, 
Dan decided to retain them and make and attach a new spine. The paste downs are the outermost leaves of the text block. These are glued to the rear of the boards. These would have been hard to remove without damaging them. However, it is necessary to pare back the paste downs far enough to enable the new scrim and tapes to be glued to the boards. Showing the paring back of the paste downs to enable the tapes to be attached to the boards while retaining the original advertising. Note the homemade paring knives. In archival bookbinding, there is the desire to use traditional adhesives that can be removed with water. But Dan and I are inclined to use modern adhesives that do not swell pulp paper fibers and maintain a degree of flexibility. You will note that this is a PVA formulation that would seem similar to many common wood glues. However, those glues would need to be diluted to spread well. The water for thinning complicates swelling of the paper, and various formulations can result in less flexible bonds or long term glue stability. I found book binding headband material is available on eBay. A couple of yards will cost you about $6, including postage. Natural cotton scrim fabric is available in most cloth stores. It wets easily with the glue and consolidates the text block. Cut a rectangle of craft paper, just the size necessary to cover the spine, and lay down before the glue on the scrim has had time to dry. Cover with a scrap of no-stick baking paper and rub vigorously with a smooth stick similar to a classic bone folder tool. Now to tackle the bookcase. A new spine back will need to be made from a piece of manila card and some royal blue book cloth. Note that the card has been rounded to sit against the rounded text block. Also notice the gap between the card and the boards to enable the boards to sit in under the shoulder of the text block. The loose ends of the book cloth are folded over and glued to the card and boards. The text block is now placed into the case and the scrim and tapes are glued down. Now all that remains is to glue the paired back paste downs over the scrim and tapes and to cover the ugly gap between the end papers and the boards with a suitably stained strip of paper. A piece of cream colored A4 printer paper was stained with tea to more closely match the end papers. The first attempt was too dark and had to be repeated with just one tea bag instead of two. The paste downs have been glued in place and the gaps covered with the stained paper strips. Now to tackle the scruffy boards. Dan says it was time to turn to another of his way too many hobbies. So much to do and so little time. Now Dan had to tidy up the tattered boards by painting with artist oil colors. Cerulean and Prussian blue did the trick.
a lick of royal blue paint from the mix of his cerulean and Prussian blue here and there on the bookboards, and a touch-up of the embossed gold type with a gold paint pen, and the job was done. Two slides back, there is a partially completed painting by Dan on the easel. Here it is completed. I guess this is proof that at least some people trying their hand at vintage radio conservation and restoration are not just one-trick ponies, eh? New subject. Fiber safety covers on backs of radios often split around screws and on corners. There is an easy way to restore considerable strength to these areas. Saturate the fiber board with Dritz brand Freycheck PVA adhesive. The adhesive has no water in it and does not cause the wood fibers to swell, but it does soak very easily into the board stock. Wrap the board in a layer of plastic wrap and clamp between two smooth blocks of wood scrap. Because it is covered and clamped, be prepared to leave it overnight for the alcohol in the adhesive to evaporate completely. There will be excess glue on the surface. A cotton ball lightly saturated in alcohol will take off the excess. Wipe quickly and then wait some seconds. Then wipe a little more. The idea is that you do not want the excess alcohol soaking in to the board. After allowing to dry for a minute or so, buff with a scrap of knit fabric. The repair should be nearly invisible and the hardened glue is waterproof. Three years ago, I wanted to exhibit this fine 1926 Bosch Ambarola broadcast receiver, but on pulling it down from the shelf, I was reminded that the original braided rayon battery cable jacket was falling apart. So here was my quick and easy fix to that problem. Decorative mesh tubing. Cheap and easy to get at your local craft store. Under $6 for 20 yards. With it, you can make bundles of wires up to about 3 8 inch diameter. Note, it's not UL rated, but my informal tests say that it is self-extinguishing when placed over bundles of UL rated PVC wiring. The mesh is used with half-inch wide tubular cotton shoelaces. One $3 lace bought online will cover a four to five foot bundle of wires. Be careful when ordering. There are other similar looking vendors that supply laces that may actually be flat woven and not braided from cotton, therefore useless for our purposes. Here is how the laces work with the mesh tubing in the previous slide. Use gentle heat to soften old insulation on the wires and work out all the kinks. And then work the wire bundle to remove wire crossovers. The plastic mesh should now easily slip over the bundle. Pull the mesh tight to consolidate the wire bundle. The mesh keeps the cotton lace from snagging on the old wires as you slide it on. Then stretch the cotton lace and whip the ends with embroidery floss to keep the ends from fraying. The embroidery floss method was often used way back then. Note that I chose to leave a fragment of the original braid so that the future conservator would know the true configuration. In my opinion, modern plastic insulation should never be seen in vintage radio restorations. Not a perfect solution, but again, it will keep most folks from being distracted by badly damaged wiring.
Inserting glue with shim stock. Loose veneer on edges of panels is a very common problem. You must clean out the old glue and soil before applying new glue. I now use 5 thousandths inch thick phosphor bronze shim stock to clean and carry slow set PVA veneer adhesive deep into the gap without stretching old brittle veneer. Much better than using even the smallest hypodermic syringe that will pass this viscous glue. Glue wets to the metal alloy better than anything I have found. The slow set characteristic of tight bond to extended wood glue gives plenty of time to squeeze out and roll out excess. These old veneers after sanding can often be less than 15 thousandths of an inch thick. To have a pocket of excess glue under the veneer leaves a very noticeable bump. So time for complete rollout of excess glue is critical, as well as allowing hours for the glue to cure, ideally overnight. Almost all old cabinet joints can be taken apart. Very few, if any, nails were used and can be found with a super magnet, then either extracted or driven through the joint. All it takes is patience, thin razor or utility knife blades, and a little water. Disposable polyethylene pipettes cost less than 10 cents each, ideal for precise placement of droplets of water and solvents. Drive blades into the joint interface and apply a few drops of water. Wait 20 minutes or so and drive the blades deeper into the joint and add more water. After a while, the joint will become loose enough to flex and separate the joint. It may be necessary to drive in an additional row of blades to protect surfaces, then place a long knife or steel rule between the blades to pry the joint apart. Use a cabinet scraper to plane off excess filler. Separate it from your work surface using clear party wrap film that is just six ten thousandths of an inch thick. Keep pressure on the scraper over the film and rotate the scraper to cut through your excess filler. Where you have a flat area inside your edges, you can also apply tape to both ends of the scraper blade and use it as a planer blade. I've mentioned this before. I really don't like to see modern plastic insulated wire easily visible on vintage electronics, especially battery cables and speaker wiring. A few years ago, I found that there were hobby assortments of super flexible silicone insulated rubber wire claiming to be equivalent to UL3132. I really did not want the multicolor spools, but had never searched in AliExpress. I see now that you can apparently get a 50 meter spool of 24 gauge wire for just $16. I've never used this supplier. In radio work, I think 24 gauge would be sufficient everywhere but filament circuits above one amp, or where peak currents would regularly go above about 1.5 amps. For TV work, there may be sweep circuits where the resistance is not low enough. Black silicone rubber insulation looks a lot like the rubber insulation of the 1920s. The wire will come with printing on the insulation, but buffing with fine steel wool will make it go away with very little effort. To mimic the braided jacket on such wires, you can use tubular woven cotton cord. You have to be careful when ordering such cord. Some vendors on Amazon will ship polyester cord or ship cord without a hollow braid. This company, FireMountainGems.com, 
has a 3 millimeter cord that meets your needs. It has filler strands that are very easy to pull out, leaving a hollow tube. All that is necessary is to wash out the wax coating with lacquer thinner. Then it is ready to use. A Sharpie will easily dye the cotton black. Cotton can be easily dyed with Brit brand fabric dyes. I have dyed this material in red, brown, forest green, and black. In recent years, they have made available a fixative solution to ensure long-term stability of the dyed cotton. So the next time I have to dye another batch of sleeving, I'll add that to the solution. Sometimes you just want it to work. 1920s vintage radios with open audio transformers, that is. Is there a way to do it without replacing the original bad audios? In many instances, the answer is yes, there is. I sure don't want to see this kind of abomination employed just to get her going for a little while. For decades, the easy way to make the set, quote, work was to substitute RC coupling for the step-up audio transformer. The penalty, of course, was the fact that with RC coupling, there is no voltage gain provided by the transformer. So amplification will definitely suffer. Enter the world of surface mount components. High performance with minuscule sized parts. The opportunity to build a functional replacement so small that it can often be completely hidden. The only necessity is to open a few circuits in the original part and tack in new connections. The postage stamp size circuit board holds 10 parts costing less than a dollar and it is on a circuit board costing less than two dollars in small quantity. So a retail price delivered ought to be under $14 plus postage. This circuit was designed by Jay Kennard in Texas, and I did the board layout. The actual board measures 0.7 by 0.85 inches square and is less than one-tenth of an inch thick. This is the circuit. Just by changing two component values, the gain can be set for 3.5 instead of 5. General distortion levels are in the range of 6%, which is typical for 1920s vintage radio designs. Jay designed a Hi-Fi version with just 2% distortion by adding another Darlington and one more resistor. But I sort of think you are committing the sin of making the circuit work better than new. I have not laid out a circuit board for that circuit, but Jay has done one that uses through-hole parts and has a much larger footprint and is three-tenths of an inch thick. You can sometimes hide the board inside a transformer shell, as in this interstage transformer used in a Radiola 3, etc. Just unsolder the transformer leads from the tag board and push down out of the way. Plenty of room to tack on the new circuit. Here is the application in the fascinating Oreo Model 100. This is a radio where I really wanted to analyze the performance of the cathode follower RF amplifier circuitry, but it has an open audio transformer in an especially awkward location. But no problem. The bad boy can stay exactly where it is, and underneath the chassis, two wire connections were unsoldered. The solid state board is simply wrapped in a slip of black paper. The 24 gauge wires to the board are covered with black one millimeter cotton braid supplied with the board, but available from any craft store jewelry department. It is used for stringing beads. The connections are tacked 
in place. Here, the board is practically hiding in plain sight. The set performs virtually identical with a comparable transformer of the day, and the radio, with its original parts in place, remains an accurate historical reference. My documentation of the radio identifies the use of this little subterfuge. As of October 2021, 34 of these units have been installed with no failures to perform correctly. Grill cloth cleaning. A very risky business, but... This Canadian Westinghouse Model 200 loudspeaker of 1925-26 vintage had to be stripped, repaired, and refinished. Could not just leave the old cloth in place. The fretwork needed repair and refinish also. Nothing lost by trying to save the cloth. Though badly stained, there were no tears. In my opinion, old grill cloth is the most fragile material you will ever work with. Be prepared for complete failure. Here is my best idea on how to protect the cloth as well as possible during cleaning. Most grill cloth of the 1920s will be attached using fish or hide glue that is water soluble. Just apply drops of water with a little dish detergent mixed in and wait some minutes. Maybe up to 20 minutes. If you go longer than that, there may be some concern of loosening the grill frame, which is likely made up of some sort of plywood. Cloth of the 1930s onwards still can be attached with these glues, but rubber cements with volatile solvents make their appearance. Typical solvents of the day were benzene, toluene, acetone, etc. But rubber oxidizes and becomes difficult to dissolve in the original or any other solvent. My thought is to immobilize the cloth inside a perforated, semi-rigid plastic pouch. Virtually every shop selling crafting supplies stock sheets of plastic canvas as used in various kinds of needle arts. It is cheap and comes in sizes up to 19 by 22 inches. Loosely stitch two sheets together along one edge to fashion a hinge. Use light sewing thread to loosely stitch your grill cloth to the bottom sheet. Don't pull the thread too tight. The cloth will shrink at least a little. You don't want the cloth to tear. Then use stitching to close the other edges to form a pouch. Lay the pouch horizontally into a pan of pleasantly warm water and a little dishwashing liquid. Lift in and out of the water a few times and allow to soak for several minutes. Lift in and out several more times and begin a gentle spray of warm water to flush soil and soap. Lay flat on a dry cotton towel to wick out water from the plastic grid. Finish the job using a hair dryer set on lowest heat to thoroughly dry the cloth. Be careful, the hair dryer can easily get the plastic too hot so that it starts to buckle and stretch. Be patient. After you are absolutely certain the cloth is totally dry, open the pouch and cut free the cloth from the bottom plastic canvas. Well, did it work? The cloth came out clean and the edges did not fray. The 10 inch wide fabric shrank only just over a quarter of an inch. Unfortunately, the fabric border was much too narrow to reattach. But I have had successes three other times. Here is a project with a happy ending. This Delco RA3 
had generous borders to the cloth so that minor shrinkage was not a problem. It worked great. A comment about the cabinet here. It had the most radically clouded and color-shifted lacquer spray I have ever seen. After solvent stripping, the true color of the veneers were readily apparent. I did apply a dilute stain to brighten the colors slightly. Nearly opaque Van Dyke stain was applied to the base and routed flutes of the vertical corners. The bird's eye maple veneer on the front of the arch was virtually invisible until stripping. Got a horn speaker missing the driver? Have fun making a high impedance loudspeaker. You have probably seen speakers where someone fitted a junk 3 inch PM speaker salvaged from a small transistor radio. Somewhere they needed to fit an impedance matching transformer. But you can do a better job using a cheap piezoelectric disc available on eBay for about a dollar. This is a high impedance load device that will have to be matched to that of the usual output tube of a 1920s radio. That matching device could well be a scrap wall wart transformer. Maybe 10 or more years ago, one of the fanatical crystal set aficionados found that modern piezoelectric discs used in smoke alarms and other warning devices could make dandy, super high impedance earphone elements. I realized that I had some of these piezo discs of 35 millimeter diameter that I had purchased after seeing a YouTube video on how to modify one to rebuild a ruined crystal phono cartridge of the 1940s. If you shop for these discs, be warned that there are two varieties of 35 millimeter discs. Do not buy the version of the disc that is bonded to a 50 millimeter clear plastic disc. Those brass discs are twice the thickness and much less efficient at audio frequencies. The plastic backing also greatly attenuates high frequencies. I wanted to experiment with one of these piezoelectric discs as a horn driver. Short answer, it works. So I cut a wafer of maple wood salvaged from the leg of a broken bar stool found on the side of the road. Turned one end to fit the throat of a Bristol horn speaker. I cut a very shallow recess on the back side and placed the disc on. I used two turns of adhesive back aluminum foil duct tape to securely hold the rim in place. After making my very crude driver, I decided to see if it would sound any better if placed in a nicely machined artificial marble housing with a sturdy steel backing plate. It really does not seem to work much better, but certainly looks more professional. I then wondered if four drivers connected in series parallel to present the same impedance load would be any more sensitive. Not more efficient at converting the sound, but you certainly could crank up power into the driver and produce painfully loud music. But a single disc is fully capable of producing equivalent volume to that of any magnetic attraction type diaphragm loudspeaker of the 1920s. You might expect that a Magnavox moving coil driver could produce more volume, but such volume would not be necessary for a typical home environment. How can I drive these piezoelectric transducers with a 1920s vintage radio? Let's look at low cost or junk box options. Nineteen twenties vintage loudspeaker windings are usually connected directly as the plate load of the final audio output vacuum tube. Piezo elements are capacitive in nature 
and will not pass the direct current necessary to establish the proper operating conditions for a vacuum tube plate circuit. An inductance or resistance must be provided to simulate the load provided by the winding of the loudspeaker. The piezo element must be protected from high direct current voltages. This is easily done by placing a non-polarized capacitor in series with the element, usually a 1 or 2 microfarad capacitor rated at twice the B-plus voltage for the tube will be sufficient. Example, 1 microfarad at 200 volts DC. A high-value bleeder resistance across the piezo element negates any typical capacitor leakage and bias buildup on the piezo. Got an old wall wart battery charger you no longer need? It might work. Old wall warts have a real iron core transformer for 5060 hertz at a specified line voltage such as 120 volts. A good candidate will be rated at about 3 watts and the DC resistance across the plug blades will be about 270 to 340 ohms. 420 volt AC use. Modern cell phone chargers are switching power supplies and are not at all suitable for this application. You can discard all the secondary parts, but should operate okay even if left in place. An old school 70 slash 25 volt intercom transformer works as well, but not significantly better. On eBay, it will cost you about $10 delivered. The wall wart may cost you nothing and can have a smaller footprint. Here is an Atwater Kent Model R speaker of 1925 vintage. The crystalline paint finish is just about perfect, but the threads holding the driver just disintegrated, and the driver is far too distorted for it to fit back into place. This is an opportunity to install one of these piezoelectric discs. Even though the disc is smaller than the original, my ears cannot really tell the difference in fidelity. I used a hole saw to cut an acrylic disc, then covered both sides with a really aggressive carpet tape. This tape can be pried loose with a lot of effort, but not likely enough force to break the brittle pot metal. I used the same one and a half inch hole saw to bore a hole through a piece of dense poplar wood. With my band saw I cut an outside radius just slightly smaller than the inside diameter of the pot metal housing. I then cut the board to a half inch thick. The two crescents of wood Provide mounting for brass number six studs. I drilled number 36 holes and tapped the holes through the block. The studs are threaded into position just so the end of the stud is maybe a millimeter shy of the bottom. The threads are saturated with super glue. The crescents are held in place using two part epoxy. It might seem easy to apply hot melt glue to retain these two wood pieces but my experience says that hot glue does not adhere to thick room temperature metal. The glue simply cools too quickly to flow. The long studs capture the body of the transformer. The woven cord passes through either side of the bobbin and is tied tightly. The cord is saturated with water-thin superglue. It makes a very secure mounting. Nuts and three solder lugs provide convenient tie points for the components. A thin plywood disc is cut to fit. The disc is sprayed with 3M Scotch 77 adhesive and stuck to a sheet of black craft felt. Stitch a string to gather the felt tightly. Stick three dots of Velcro hooks to the inside of the horn base. The cover will stay in place nicely.
Here I use the same wall wart transformer type and a couple of 0.5 microfarad 200 volt film capacitors and a 100K bleeder resistor. But here I glued the apex of a homemade paper cone of about 5.5 inch diameter to the center of the same type of 35 millimeter disc. The cabinet is a cube of some scrapped sheetrock. This arrangement works somewhat louder than a Radiola 100A pin driver speaker and has better high frequency response. Repairing a pin driver loudspeaker. I have this Canadian Westinghouse Model 200 high impedance speaker from circa 1926. The cabinet needed refinishing and the driver was open. I've had this outfit for 20 years, but had never opened it. I was surely surprised to see the cone. It is actually the same cone as used in a Radiola Model 100 speaker, but is formed to drastically reduce the depth of the cone. It is a single piece of parchment, and I have yet to figure out how it was rolled into that shape. This pin driver coil assembly was open circuit. Time to wind new coils. But this steel pin link between the balanced armature and the cone attachment point is crimped and hard brazed with brass. It has to be cut in order to remove the coils. So how was I going to restore the pin? 18 gauge steel needles are available for glue bottles. You can cut a length of this needle using a small abrasive cutoff disc. A loop of loose yarn is pulled through the tubing and then the two ends of the cut pin driver are inserted. The yarn serves as a wick to draw in thin superglue. Then add a drop of curing agent. Here is a circa 1910 Wireless Specialty Apparatus Company Paracon and Pyron detector box. The problem is that the appearance of this tag cannot be improved beyond what you see here with any techniques that I'm aware of. The terminals on top of the box were filthy black. On the left, you see terminals after a light cleaning with acetone and alcohol to remove any materials that would repel water. It would be quick and easy to pop these parts into an ultrasonic cleaner and then polish them to a bright yellow brass color, but the hard rubber panel cannot be returned to anything like its new condition, and if done so, they would contrast horribly with the large etch tag on the side of the box. So I think it's better to clean these parts only partially. Note that I did remove the bottom panel nuts. You do not want to use any water-based cleaners on old hard rubber. This is the time to take an artist's paint tray and sprinkle a tiny pinch of sodium bisulfate crystals into a well of the tray and then squeeze a couple of milliliters of over-the-counter strength hydrogen peroxide into the well. Use a hog bristle brush to gently stroke the parts just to the point where you think you are down to the last layer of patina. It is a tough call to decide when enough is enough, all made more difficult because you can only do one part at a time. So this battle is won by the slow and not the quick. How do folks know what stuff is? It cannot tell you. Often item viewers don't even know what questions to ask. What if there is no expert around? If there is not a knowledgeable person to question or easy to read documentation immediately at hand, we move on to something else. But we may have missed a fascinating insight into the hardware, the entity that created it, or the reason for its very existence.
Most folks have a smartphone handy, and there are free apps to read QR codes with just a couple of clicks. QR codes are easier than ever to make. This is a simple and fast way to open a potential floodgate of information on the item. A couple of clicks later, the viewer is at a site with the information they need, and they can download or bookmark it for future reference. It can be easy, fast, and free. Going to this website, the-qrcode-generator.com, brings up this simple generator. In this case, select the tab that says you want to generate a URL. Then paste the URL you want to appear, and then click on the 300 pixel box. You click Save, and this box pops up, asking what format. Select PNG, and then click Save in the pop-up box. It will be saved into your browser downloads folder. Find the Downloads File folder for your browser and select your file. Open the file with your favorite simple photo editor. Before pasting it into a document, you will probably want to crop the image to something like inside the red box, say an inch square. Add a few words to tell you what the QR code is for. I use a cheap Brother black and white laser printer. It is ready to go in less than a minute. Unlike an inkjet printer, the ink does not dry out and need to go through multiple cleaning cycles. The black laser toner is very stable over time. The QR codes can be glued on a metal tag that can be permanently attached in various ways. They can be less than an inch square. Tags attached to artifacts do not have to be placed right side up. Need to remove the tag? Here, just 1.5 millimeter nail holes can be patched with just a dot of colored wax. Stainless steel wire can attach it to an existing hole. Metal tags can be captured by existing screws. Here is my final slide. That of a pristine original FEDA 260B AM broadcast band receiver of 1936 vintage. I get it. Fixing up old radio gear is fun. And most folks are not professional historians and professional museum conservators. But when you acquire a new artifact, I urge you to at least seriously ask yourself, and maybe your friends in the hobby, to consider the historical value of an item, not just the current commercial value or your anticipation of short-term pleasure in doing particular work. In reality, the number of electromechanical devices that have survived unmodified and looking in pristine condition for more than 75 years is becoming very rare. We can all appreciate that while these artifacts can appear factory new, we know that the components were never designed to last for decades and simply cannot be powered up and expected to operate safely from household power. At least ask if the item is best left recognized as a rare historical artifact. It is highly likely that there are similar sets that have already gone through multiple expedient repairs and modifications over the decades and no longer serve as accurate historical references to the day of manufacture. There you can employ your own repair techniques guilt-free to make it work for a few years more and look nice enough on a shelf.